So to start off with, Sanjay, why are we seeing leopards straying into Bengaluru and some of these areas, if you look on Google Maps, like Kudlu Gate, it looks very densely populated. How is it possible that a big cat is wandering around these areas? Um, <clears throat> these are not very regular incidents, you know, first of all, we have to be very clear about it. And second thing is, uh, Bangalore has quite a bit of natural and suboptimal leopard habitats in its periphery. It could even be Banergata National Park, which adjoins ba uh, Bangalore City. And there are, you know, our uh, studies, camera trapping study shows there are about 40 leopards inside the National Park. And around the city, we have done a bit of work. And we estimate that we have about 30 to 35 leopards around the city. It could be Hesargata, around Kanakpura Road, around Nice Road. All these areas has about 30 to 35 leopards. And um, some of these areas are excellent uh, uh, leopard habitats like rocky outcrop. They may not be forest and they may not be legally protected, but they provide two important facts for leopards. One is food, the other one is cover. And when uh, large cats... Uh, especially uh, adaptable species like the leopard gets these two aspects covered, it's very likely that we are going to have them there. Uh, but as Bangalore has been uh, growing phenomenally and exponentially in whatever way you look at it, these habitats, both the natural and suboptimal habitats, have been making way for urbanization. And leopard being a very adaptable species and due to its body size, uh, it is able to survive on small prey like black naped hair, it could even be uh, civet, it could be bandicoot, it could be also domestic animals like dogs and uh, chicken and goat and sheep. That's why they continue to survive on the periphery of Bangalore. And sometimes some of these individuals stray and perhaps even get into very human dominated areas like the recent couple of recent incidents. A lot of Bangalore is basically now expanding into suburban areas, into peri-urban areas. So it is, as you, you pointed out, that this is primed for some of these incursions every now and then. Uh, so, but how does the, what would your advice be as a biologist, as a conservationist for city planners? Yeah, Banu, like you rightly said, you know, Bangalore is expanding into peri-urban areas. And um, these areas had leopards for a very long time. It's not a new phenomena. It's just that people are seeing or I put seeing in court in courts leopards more often because everybody has a CCTV today. Houses have CCTV, farmhouses have CCTVs. A lot of people, both in the urban areas and rural areas, tend to have closed circuit televisions today, and they tend to document record, you know, leopards or sloth bear and other mammals on these uh, devices. And suddenly they feel that oh, leopard has appeared in our area. It's not that. They were not there earlier. It's just that they're able to see it more often due to incursion of CCTV. That's also one reason why suddenly people are thinking, oh, leopards are being seen everywhere now. But they have been there. It is just that we are documenting or we are seeing their presence more often now. And uh, uh, when we come to peri-urban areas being urbanized and uh, how do we plan this, that's something which is really uh, lacking in a country like in India because we don't think long term, uh, we are not looking at zone, zonation. Like in a house, you know, on a, uh, in my house, your house, uh, we would, uh, or in anybody's house, we plan where is a living room and what do we do in a living room. We also plan what do you do in a kitchen. It's it's mentally, mentally and also physically very uh, bifurcated. Kitchen is for certain activities. A bedroom is for certain activities. Living room, a puja room or a bathroom is for certain activities. We zone it very well. Unfortunately, when city develops, we don't zone them like this. You know, they zone it, of course, like from an agricultural perspective, but not from an environmental and wildlife perspective. So that's something which is very important. For example, south of Bangalore on the Kanakpura Road, there is BM Kaval Reserve Forest, UM Kaval Reserve Forest. Then there is the Rory Chested. And then there is Golali Gudda Reserve Forest. All of this connect to Banergata National Park. But in between these uh, stretches of protected reserve forest, there's also stretches of deemed forest, which is legally not protected, but all, are also under private ownership. So until and unless we start thinking, okay, these areas are going to be ensconed 
in human dwellings in 10, 20 years or 15 years from now. And there are leopards, there are sambas. We even documented otter in Brody Chested. How do we ensure that these animals continue to survive there? Can we leave these areas away for as a urban space, green urban space, but also for a space for wildlife and then plan for urbanization is what we lack today. So we certainly, uh, for example, a few years ago, I have proposed that BM Kaval, UM Kaval and the, uh, uh, you know, Golali Gudda and other reserve forests have to be notified as a conservation reserve so that that area stays legally protected. Uh, it's not that you, you get more greenery or whatever it is. They already are under green cover. It's just that you get extra layer of legal cover. And diverting them for non-forestry activities becomes uh, goes through more scrutiny. So hence, it's very important that we zo plan for zonation. And that zonation plan should include large mammals in places like Bangalore. It can be Bangalore, it can be uh, Mumbai, it can be Pune, it can be, or even within Karnataka, it should be Ramnagar, Tumkur, Chanpatna, Mysore. All of these have leopards on their peripheries or uh, on the adjoining of the towns and cities. So we need to ensure that we plan properly. Like you rightly said about environmental impact assessment, any construction uh, which goes beyond 200,000 square meters of built up area needs an EIA, environment impact assessment. And it also needs clearance from the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. And even when it comes to such kind of clearances, we need to seriously, I mean, we need to seriously factor in the presence and existence of large mammals, especially those that have a potential to uh, cause conflict with people. I'm sure you know, October, I think around the 10th or 11th of October, the uh, state government said that they were mulling over allowing construction within uh, close to one kilometer, within one kilometer of a protected area like Banagrata. Um, and this happened on October 10th and uh, by around early November, we had this uh, leopard coming into Bangalore. So what is the, are you concerned about these kinds of um, thoughts that the government is having so to speak yeah certainly you know uh, uh, with the growth of bangalore when the 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 poly there is no policies how we could check the population growth and also um uh, new um population coming to the city on a daily basis and we continue to have this large area like banergata national park which is about 260 square kilometers and which is very large and has not just leopards it has tigers it has elephants. We have documented actually two tigers in Banergata National Park. There are elephants, there are gore, there are crocodiles, there are sambardia, there are cheetal, there are four-horned antelope. All of these large mammals need that space. And they have been, uh, been in that area for a very, very long time. I'm sure through human evolution as well. So until and unless we think, okay, these we are lucky enough to have leopards and elephants and gore and uh, tigers at a stone throw from the city, we need to ensure that they are protected. It's not that they need to be, the, the construction and the city has to be to the edge of Banirgata National Park. That's why the concept of eco-sensitive zone came up. And uh, with Banirgata, the eco-sensitive zone norms are not really implemented well. Uh, so that is something of real conservation uh, worry. The Supreme Court very clearly said these eco-sensitive zones actually need to act as buffer to a protected area. And recently, an elevated road has been proposed and uh, approved through the State Board for Wildlife in the within the eco-sensitive zone itself, and which also perhaps passes through the National Park, if I actually see the alignment properly. So we need to draw a line where do we do development? Where do we give priority to development? And where do we give priority to nature? That's something which really need to come on the priority list of citizens today. Then, um, so, okay, just to get to something a little more practical and urgent, something people worry about, if they do come across a leopard or they hear that there's a leopard in their neighborhood, what's your... What are your top suggestions? What should they do? What should they remember? Number one, don't panic. Leopards are, <laughs> they, they're as afraid as we are about leopards. So first thing is certainly the people should certainly not panic about uh, le if they hear about leopards or even if they see leopards, they certainly need shouldn't be panicking at all. Uh, number two, 
inform the authorities, the forest department, and if they know of conservationists who work on this aspect, it's best that they inform them. And uh, third thing is, immediately they should start, or even before they get into emergency situation, they should start building awareness about, within their own communities on how to deal with the presence of a large mammal like a leopard. So, for example, I would suggest that people, if they see a leopard in their area, they shouldn't run away from the animal if they are at close encounters with a leopard, if they have a close encounter on foot. Don't run away, don't panic, stay calm and walk back, keeping your eye all the time on the animal. Normally, the animal will move away because it's very afraid of people as well. And don't, if you see leopard presence, don't move around after dark, especially with children because sometimes leopards can um, mistake small human beings to prey. And uh, if, if people are in peri-urban areas, in rural areas, or even in urban areas, if they're defecating in the open, I think that's something which can attract leopards' attention, thinking it's a very small, uh, a small animal. So that should be certainly curtailed. Uh, then, uh, very importantly, don't spread false messages. That's extremely useful. Everything you see on WhatsApp is not true. Like everything that's white is not milk. Everything you see on WhatsApp is certainly not true or on social media is not true. So don't believe social media in such situations because I have seen a lot of incidences where people have uh, uh, circulated images of leopards from our own images from our camera trap work from some other area and calling it leopards in Banshankri in Bangalore. So don't uh, please believe the social media. Or if you want to, best thing is to cross verify with uh, sources which are reliable. Okay, the, that's a good one. Um, so the government has also proposed a leopard task force, right? Now after this for Bangalore. And uh, I, could you tell us what, you know, let's say if you were in charge of such a task force, what would you do? What would this task force have? What would their work be? Uh, if I was given that opportunity to do it, I would first train them, build their capacity to handle conflict situations, especially emergency conflict situations for places like Bangalore. So that's extremely important um, because that is what is lacking as well. And, we, and when we have full-time people who are going to look into conflict, uh, first thing is they have to be extremely well-trained. Training is one, but training them, retraining them continuously through refresher courses is extremely important so that they understand both animals and people and handling conflict situations like handling mob, handling crowd, how to deal with uh, media and those kinds of things. That's one thing. Second thing is to equip them with the right kind of equipment, uh, the tools required, uh, uh, veterinarians, trained veterinarians on wildlife um, uh, matters. Uh, and also how to control mob. You know, that's very important as well because that's where we uh, tend to fail. I don't call it tend to fail, but that's where it's very difficult to handle, especially if it's a, it's a large city like Bangalore. Uh, so these are my, would be my priorities, capacity building, retraining, equip them, equipping them very well, and just also training them on several other aspects, including animals, biology, behavior, handling the media, uh, handling fake news and other aspects. Okay. Uh, so uh, I think this is a sort of related question because uh, when this latest leopard was captured and it died, there was a lot of, a lot of people are also upset about that. Right? They felt, how could this happen? The forest department killed it. And if you look at the media also, there are vastly different reports of how exactly it happened. And I was wondering if you can... Uh, someone who's experienced firsthand an out of control crowd and mob when these situations happen, could you explain what is it that people should understand about how challenging or what is the challenge with catching animals like this? Uh, unfortunately, I was not there in Bangalore that day when that incident happened, but whatever I have seen on the media and uh, also on videos and other things, first thing people need to understand is it's a very tricky situation. And the animal itself is a difficult animal to spot, to monitor, to navigate, and even to tranquilize the animal. It's a very difficult situation. It's not as easy as people think and talk about it. Uh, capturing a large uh, animal like leopard uh, is very tricky. 
uh, it's much more tricky if it's in in a human habitation or in a human dominated area because you can continue to monitor the animal but there are a lot of interventions by people you know media personnel want to be there on the in the on the front lines they want to get their best footage uh, people are curious they want to get their best footage on their mobile phones uh, people want to know what is happening so it's a very tricky situation for the forest department as well it's not as easy as we all speak certainly i agree that uh, if we are better trained on handling these situations and if we understand the biology of the animal we can handle things there's a lot of scope for improvement is what i would say uh, but i would really not solely blame the forest department on that situation because i have seen these situations in a very big manner there are a lot of other interventions that happen which make things go haywire right so crowd management is a huge challenge in these it's an extraordinarily uh, challenging situation with crowd uh, because we are not disciplined we don't tend to listen to law we don't tend to listen to lawmakers even in situations like that unfortunately uh, so crowd management is the biggest challenge when uh, such situations arise finally i think one of the things i've seen in a few other interviews you have often talked about how ultimately we're just going to have to the best option is if we can coexist right with wild animals like leopards because they already exist and they yeah. they know how to move around our spaces can you like i i would love to know what what is your vision of how this would happen what what should people understand when you say look let's just coexist with these animals coexistence is again a very um important subject but also a very uh, subject which needs a lot more debate than what it is promoted a typical or a ideal coexistence situation would be where animals and or large mammals or wildlife and people are living very happily it's like um, uh, you know living they lived happily forever such kind of situation that's what most people think coexistence is but uh, the the fact for the fact of the matter the ground situation is completely different i would say conflict is going to continue and conflict has been there for a very long time with uh, wildlife and people but what needs to be ensured is conflict is under tolerable limits it's not just win win for one party either for people or for wildlife so both parties need to have a balanced um uh solution for themselves or a sorry a balanced uh, result for both parties it can't be like in hasan in karnataka uh, people talk about coexistence yes the human death numbers have come down but the number of elephants killed captured translocated is enormously very high so that's not coexistence according to me uh, that's a false narrative that has been promoted that hasan situation is coexistence that's not a good coexistence model or even in maharashtra especially the the district of junnar is always thought to be a model of coexistence between people and leopards but if you look at data last this year alone uh, already junnar district had uh, 29 issues with leopards 29 serious consequences from leopard including human deaths so that's not a good situation and also leopards are captured translocated taken to captivity that's not a good situation and that's not coexistence actually coexistence is also the acceptance and the narrative of coexistence has to come from communities who have to live with uh, with these large conflict prone species not from academicians not from us actually they have to say yes we are coexisting coexisting with wildlife and that would be good model you know where people are saying yes i i want to coexist with a leopard or with an elephant or with a sloth sloth bear and there is minimal casualty on both sides it can't be unbalanced it can't be imbalanced that casualties of elephants is very high in hasan and the casualties of humans have come down but there's huge casualty on the on the side of elephant that's not coexistence in my opinion there should be a balance between both uh finally i well, could you tell us a little bit about holy mati and what work you're doing especially around um, large mammals like leopards what is the work that you're doing what should people know about your team 
That's a thank you for giving us an opportunity to brag ourselves a little bit. Uh, we run the largest uh, leopard monitoring project in the country now. Uh, we have been uh, doing this work for almost 12 years now, monitoring leopard populations. I think I'm very happy that um, uh, we we have enough data. At least we we were the first state in the country to say how many leopards exist in a large space like a state. Karnataka is 191,000 square kilometers of geographic area. And we are very confidently being able to tell that we have about two to two and a half thousand leopards in the state now. And where leopards numbers are higher and lower and the distribution we are able to very confidently tell and also scientifically uh, provide this data. And we are also able to show that where leopard conflict is very high. So Karnataka has 31 districts, out of which five districts contribute over 50% of leopard conflict incidences in the state. Uh, like Hassan, Tumkur, Ramnagra, Udupi, uh, Mandya. These are the state uh, districts which, and these days even in Koppal, uh, districts which contribute over 50% of leopard conflict incidents in, in the state. So what we need to do is we have provided a, a basic a baseline for the government to say where this focus of leopard human conflict interventions has to take place. So these are the areas where priority has to be put up for monitoring or managing human leopard conflict. That's what we also do. And we also try to help during uh, human leopard conflict situations, both to the communities and also with the with the forest department. We try to work in tandem with them and provide uh, uh, expertise and scientific information wherever possible. That's the other thing. And the, uh, the, the next work we also do is also on working with communities and outreach on leopard conflict as well. Uh, we have certain uh, outreach activities which are um, all carried out in local uh, languages, which is very important. And many areas, uh, even in Bangalore, for example, in south of Bangalore, some of the gated communities, some of the schools have accepted leopards in their uh, in their courtyards or in their backyards now. That's a that's a very important thing. They they say that they're willing to have leopards in their backyards. And I'm, I would not say that it has been the same with all communities, but at least some of the communities have been very accepting these days. That's the primary work we do on leopards. Um, okay, thank you so much, Sandeep. Thank you for joining us uh, and telling us so much about this incident and what people should understand and think about for, uh, when they encounter or hear of a wild animal in their city for joining us. Thank you, Banu.